Why does it seem like men over 40 seem less like they're likely to commit? I think that's a question worth exploring and diving deeper into how a man actually shows his level of commitment and relationship, and we'll get into those seven signs in a moment. The reality is these days, folks, we have to address the elephant in the room is that the vast majority of human beings in interpersonal relationships are rather dysfunctional. Their emotional, uh, emotional maturity, their relationship skills are weak. Their EQ or emotional quotient is rather weak. I think it's important to address that. I think also the delusion that most people are emotionally mature and have good relationship skills. So isn't it kind of a conundrum is that there's this belief that people are good at it and at the same time, they're terrible at it. Everybody thinks that they're the exception. And the reality is I don't care who you are out there listening to this, a man or woman, the vast majority of human beings have poor relationship skills and weak emotional maturity. Now, it doesn't mean they're not capable of it. It just means that they're not good at it. The reality is, is especially in romantic relationships, people are not good at it. How do we know this? What's the evidence? Well, the evidence is, is here in the United States, we have a 50% divorce rate for first marriages. And if you get married a second or third time, it's 60 to 75% of divorce rate. What that means is the vast majority of people haven't figured out how to have a juicy, delicious, healthy, happy relationship. Think about that. The vast majority of human beings have not. And there's a couple causes for this. Now, one of the primary causes is childhood wounds and traumas and adult traumas that go unhealed. This is true for men and women alike. For those folks that haven't healed from their childhood wounds or adult traumas. And one of the most significant adult traumas is divorce. And roughly about 75% of singles who are over 45 years are divorced. So, while I'm differentiating between men over 40 versus those men in their 20s and 30s, the reality is, is when, you, when you turn 21 years old, let's say here in the United States, by your 22nd birthday, you're simply just a one-year-old adult. That's right, a one-year-old adult. Think about it. When the first couple years of, of, of since birth, you're literally predominantly taken care of by another human being. Just even going to the bathroom, well, not going to the bathroom, but cleaning up your poop requires someone else to be involved in the process. And a person doesn't really start to know, begin to know who they are until maybe age 13, 14 or 15. And what happened prior to that age can indicate how that person shows up as an adult. And what I mean is, did they have wounds? Did they have their traumas? So, okay, now fast forward, you're in your 20s and 30s, because I want to differentiate the, the 40 year old group versus the 20 or 30 year old group. Most of your childhood wounds and traumas don't really bubble up until the surface until you hit 40. This is why many of you heard the term midlife crisis. What I call that is when the blueprint of what you think your life is going to be like collides with your reality. That's what I think midlife crisis is. So we get to those men in their 40s. If 75% of people are divorced, remember I said childhood wounds and traumas? Well, this is an adult trauma. A divorce is a very traumatic event. And if remember I said healed, the differentiating factor is for emotional maturity is have you healed from your childhood wounds and traumas? And in addition, have you developed any good skills, relationship skills? One of the primary relationship skills to be able to master is conflict resolution. In addition, not operating from a place of being right. You know, we, there's, a, there's a saying amongst my circle of friends, would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? Well, a significant percentage of the population in romantic relationships would rather be right than happy. Their point of view is the only point of view. And until someone has done some deep inner work, this is why I continually recommend the book, The Hoffman Process. And this is, I did this in their Napa Valley location or their Northern, or 
Central California location, okay? This is a deep dive into healing child and wounds and traumas. And it is worth investing in yourself because just because you meet the right man doesn't mean you're the right woman. Just because you're the right woman doesn't mean you're going to re- meet the right man. However, it's important to recognize that it starts, the pr- relationship readiness flowchart starts with being your best self, okay? Both physically and emotionally, okay? So I'm going to dive into those seven signs he's, a, he's most likely to commit to you. But really quickly, I think it's important to discuss the five stages of relationships, That's right, the five stages of relationships. And I'm going to read them off really quickly. I have my notes. It's this, every couple goes through this. Well, they go through some of these stages, I should say. The honeymoon stage, the doubt denial stage, the dissolution disillusionment stage, the decision stage, and then lastly, the commitment stage. Okay, so I want to start off with the honeymoon stage. This is where everybody believes the minute you have this intense chemistry for one another, it equals relationship success. What we've learned, though, or at least what I'm teaching, what I've learned is that chemistry attraction is just merely the tip of the iceberg. Below the waterline is compatibility. Do you share the same values? Are your lifestyles blendable? This is for the over 40 crowd. And more importantly, is this person emotionally mature enough to be in relationship? And if you don't know how to pick people like that, if you need some support of learning how to vet for emotional maturity, how to vet for compatibility, how to screen these people, how to filter both filter in and filter out, then check out a discovery. There's a link right here to schedule a discovery call with me to see if working with a coach is right for you. There's a link below as well. Why am I sharing this with you? Because my clients call me up all the time. Jonathan, I met a great guy. Jonathan, I met a great guy. Jonathan, I met a great guy. And they know the difference, which we're going to talk about in a moment as well. So the honeymoon stage, again, It's that oftentimes luster limerent stage. This is where sometimes love bombing happens. This is a lot of times where they go, oh my God, you're the most amazing woman. I've never met a woman like you. I could see myself being married to you. Folks, I've said it before. It doesn't make me a bad guy. It's just when you're enthusiastic, when you're excited about a woman, you feel this sense of euphoria because dopamine is being released from your brain into your body saying, I feel good with this person. But we talked about the honeymoon stage. Well, the reality is, is that might last for a very short period of time. And what's next is the doubt, the d- doubt or denial phase, because this is where you actually, a man or woman leans into, is this person really right for me? Instead of doing it beforehand, they do it after this fact. And what happens for a lot of men is they go, oh my gosh, this person isn't right for me. I'm not feeling this love I thought I was feeling. Now, some men ghost, but you know what other men do? And women do this as well. They do what's called fizzling, fizzling. And I wrote this down in incremental less effort, incremental less effort. This is called fizzling. So you've had this great six weeks, you know, with this guy or three months with the guy. And all of a sudden things start to fizzle. His communication is less. His text messaging is less. He's not asking to see you as much. He seems to be busy. Busy seems to be the easy out for men and women, particularly men. I'm busy, busy, busy. All of a sudden he's busy. I can't make it this weekend. I can't see you this weekend. He fizzles this out, fizzles the relationship out. In some ways, that's more toxic than ghosting. At least ghosting is, boom, I'm done with you. I've moved on. I'm not going to contact you again. As brutal as that is, I wonder if it's worse to fizzle someone out. You know, I'm just, I'm like, have you ever had that? Have you ever had anyone fizzle out on you? They just started to back out a little bit. If you have, please post a comment below. Please write a comment in the chat box. How did that feel? You know, I oftentimes say go dating triggers the number one emotional health issue. We're all feeling is I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable and I'm not likable. Think about that. And dating triggers this. Relationships trigger this like nobody's business. Excuse my slurping. 
By the way, my coffee mug says, don't make me go all psycho roommate on you. Yeah, I'm going a little psycho roommate on you today. By the way, one of the reasons why I wrote my book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? A Journey of Personal Development, Self-Help, and Spiritual Work. By the way, there's a link below to get a copy of my book. The reason why I wrote my book is because that place of I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, I'm not likable is the one of the most critical places within a person's life to establish their their sovereignty their self-worth their self-esteem and more importantly their self-respect so when you see a man is fizzling you call him out on his behavior and the minute you by the way you all know i'm going to suspect you all know when you start to see a shift in behavior i dated a woman some years back for i liked her at first we had dated for about three weeks, but something, you know, it just wasn't clicking. It just wasn't feeling. And we saw each other a bunch of times because she lived right up the street. And something clicked where I'm just not feeling it. I couldn't put my finger as to why this was happening. And she noticed a shift in my behavior quickly. And she reached out and said, I noticed you're not reaching out as much as something up. And I owned it. I owned it. I said, you know what? I'm just not feeling what I thought I would be feeling at this point. She goes, it sounds like it isn't going to work. And I'm like, well, I don't know what to do. Yeah, maybe, you know, end this. And that's what happened. Now, some men might drag it out, but you'll know the difference between men dragging it out because they make excuses instead of actually leaning into that feeling. That's what emotional maturity is. Okay. The next stage, the disillusionment stage. This is where problems become more obvious. That's kind of the winter phase. I, I was watching a documentary on David Foster. He's the record producer who's put you know so many stars on the map like uh, Whitney Houston and so many others. I can't think of them right now. That he has a habit, the minute there's friction in the relationship, he'd get divorced. By the way, this guy, I think he's been married like 20 times. I'm being tongue in cheek, kidding here. But he'd get married, minute there's friction, he'd bail. He had abandonment in his life. He had childhood wounds that went un, un, unresolved, unhealed. Now, I bet you he had a Deepak Chopra book on his nightstand, and the woman's thinking, oh my gosh, you know, he does so much inner work. But true inner work is that book is highlighted and pages are bent versus it's just sitting there unopened. How many people invest in some sort of self-help but they do it so cursory that they don't actually heal from the work. I'm going to share with you something. I'm constantly reevaluating my own emotional baseline, and I do it with my partner. There's a picture of my sweetheart there. I'd say every day I do that because I have some significant wounds in childhood that creates a very anxious behavior in me. It makes me not trust love. And certainly after losing my son, there's a picture of him right there. That's my 19 year old son who passed away, Connor. There's this hole inside of me because, and it feels like an abandonment to love someone and then have them be gone. That's a deep wound within me. And I'm still working on healing that, though I'm choosing to grieve with love. Okay, the fourth stage, and I wanna get moving on. So you've gone through the disillusion. That's the decision-making stage. Do you end the relationship? Do you no, do nothing and be miserable? Or do you stay and try to fix it? And that's the fifth stage, is actually working on your relationship together. That's a co-creative relationship. Those are the five stages. So now we're gonna lean into those seven great signs he's ready to commit to you. I wanna blow through these really quickly because I felt like I got a baseline for you. And those seven signs. He makes time for you and keeps in touch with you. That's rather obvious. You know, I, 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 and by the way, it's not text messaging. He actually makes a telephone call and he actually makes time to physically see you on a regular basis. The, it seems to me the most healthy, successful relationships are the one where they see each other significantly doing shared activities, hobbies, mutual interests, where they're really developing the friendship. Number two, his actions match his words. You know, that's a sign of integrity. You know, if you haven't read the book, The Four Agreements, 
Highly recommend reading the four agreements for yourself. This is where actions match one's words, along, amongst other things. Number three, he's transparent about his past. Whether we like it or not, our past is a clue to how someone is going to operate in the future. And it's rather, I think, critically important to get a baseline of someone's emotional maturity, to have healthy discussions about our past relationships and experiences. And in some ways, if you can, even laugh about them. I and mean, when I, I don't mean to laugh in a in a disingenuine way, I just simply mean to go, wow, look at all these trials and tribulations I went to to get to this place in my life. And I sometimes laugh at it merely to say, wow, why wasn't I taught this stuff sooner? Back to my private coaching, I hear this all the time. Jonathan, why didn't they teach me this in school? Why didn't my parents teach me this? Why didn't I learn this before I married the wrong guy? That's because everything we've learned about relationships is wrong. That's the reality of it. Everything we've learned about relationships is mostly wrong. Number four, he engages you in his life. He asks for help. He asks for your opinion. He even does housework. You know, it's funny. In my relationship, my partner, again, there's a picture of Marie right behind me with the Buddha right there. She was in India. We were just talking about that last night. You know, she like, I was a bachelor. I could go days with the uh, stuff in the kitchen sink. You know, I wasn't so particular. I did make my bed every morning, but I wasn't as particular when I lived by myself. And now with a partner, she likes to wake up to a clean kitchen. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I didn't get into a power struggle with her. It demonstrates just simply doing the act of keep, you know, being engaged in your relationship. And she asked for that. That demonstrates a sign of commitment. When people scoff at your desires, they scoff at your desires of, of actually living in a better home as an example, that's a sign of relationship weakness. Number five, he asks to meet your family and friends. He wants to see your life and he wants to invite you into his life. And while this alone isn't always a guarantee, it certainly means that you're moving in the right direction. Number six, he's protective of you and not just in the physical sense, he's protective of you in the emotional sense. Folks, many of you know that the most important aspect of a relationship is trust. And trust isn't just about fidelity. Trust is, does this person care about my feelings as much as I care about my own? Does this person have my best interest at heart? That is a true protector in a relationship, not just in the physical realm, but also in the emotional realm. And I don't mean avoiding conflict as a way to protect. Well, I didn't want to hurt you, so I didn't want to tell you I was meeting my ex-girlfriend for coffee. That's not protecting. A real protect, if, you were, if someone was going to meet their ex for coffee for whatever reason, a healthy person, if they really wanted to protect your emotions, would simply share that this is going to happen. This is the boundary I'm going to set around this. And I will follow up with you immediately when I've wrapped up. And there's probably some sort of significant reason why. When they're secretive, that's that might be to protect you. Well, I didn't want to hurt you. I think most men have adopted the, the philosophy, it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Has anyone ever had that happen? It's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Being protective means opening up to the emotional aspects of life and being emotionally protective of you in the sense of being fully transparent with you. And lastly, he understands that relationships are about the future versus living in the moment. seems like these days every guy wants to just, let's just live in the moment. Let's just have fun. Let's just live in the moment. Listen, the minute two people engage in regular sex together, that is a relationship. But more importantly, is it a casual relationship? Is it what I call a relationship? It's a friends with benefit relationship, but you just don't know about it. Or is there a serious conversation and dialogue about how to take this to a future level? I think one of the benefits of being in a long distance relationship is we quickly made a decision that if we wanted this to work, we'd have to move in together. We made a big commitment to one another. 
Listen, could have that blown up in our face? Hapsa, effin'lutely, that could have blown up in our face. I think though, because we had done so much personal development, self-help and spiritual work, since we did a lot of healing from our past and we unpacked all those things very early on when we did radical honesty, lay our cards on the table and establish the rules of engagement, it probably, it certainly amplified our relationship. And, and I'm grateful now that coming up on a year, we still get along great. We haven't had any major fights. And because I think we did, I can only say this. Look, we met through a dating app, dating site. I practice what I preach and I use the tools in my private coaching that many of you have already experienced a juicy, delicious, happy relationship. I practice what I preach and I use my tools to attract a great partner in my life. And I want the same for you as well. All right, did you find value in this video? If you did, please hit that thumb button. Please hit that like, uh, please hit the likes. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel, hit the bell. If you need some support, there's a link below in the description in the show notes to schedule a discovery call with me to join my low price, low, low cost group to check out all the books I recommend to check out the naked discovery, naked recovery group to join my membership and get all the books I recommend in the link below.